to the Spring 2018 Convocation of the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law. First things first, congratulations. this day in the 103rd year of University of Arizona Law, we honor each of you, graduates as well as those who have had a hand in getting you to this day. Welcome all. Let me acknowledge the special guests who join us on the stage this afternoon, each of whom will be more formally introduced later in the program. Our alumna, Ana Maria Chavez, who's now whose national leadership and service animates our hopes for each graduate and serves as an outstanding example for the entire community. Christine Thompson, the incoming president of the Law College Association. <laughs> Graduating students, Kayla Bernays, Mia Hammersley, Benjamin Parsalaw, The three speakers selected by members of their graduating class and graduating SBA president and vice president Rachel Dykeman and Sarah Wright who lead the 2018 class gift committee. <laughs> Joining us on the stage are those who have dedicated their professional lives to your education. Most of whom, many of whom, I hope all of whom made it possible for you to imagine that you would get to this point. We have been your mentors, your helpers, your friends. I will call the names of faculty and administrators, ask them to stand, and I request that you hold your applause until all introductions are made. Barbara Atwood, Jane Bambauer, Kathy Barnes, Paul Bennett, Barbara Bergman, Michael Brooks, Mike Shirazi, Terry Lee Cluck, Andy Cohen, Willie Jordan Curtis, James Diamond, Kirsten Engel, Joy Cardillo, Robert Hershey, James Hopkins, Christine Husky, Monet Mel, Karen Kowalski, Jason Craig, Sylvia Lett, Lori Lewis, David Marcus, Lynn Marcus, Tony Massaro, Nina Raven, Jamie Ratner, Chris Robertson, Susie Salmon, Andy Silverman, Billy Shostrom, Roy Spies, Alan Sternstein, Keith Swisher, Melissa Tatum, Rebecca Tosi, Carolyn Williams, and Rob Williams. Please join me in here. Class of 2018, today is a day worth thinking about, remembering how you got here, and with great anticipation, which we share, looking forward to where you may go. You arrived here a year, two years, three years ago, bringing your own experiences, relationships, geographies, politics, religions, perspectives, and dreams. And we have come to know you well, as individuals with deep and profound talents that will not only accrue to your personal benefit, but to ours and to make as well, and to make your mark on your communities and your societies, indeed, given our class on the world. From those different paths, you have came together and created a community here. And as a group, 
you articulate some common characteristics. I'd like to reflect on those for a moment. Every year we ask members of the class to submit information about their experiences here, and we do a little interviewing of our own on the side. Here's what we believe to be true about you as a group, the collective. You like pizza a great deal. <laughs> and you have eaten vast sums in your time here. When pizza lost its allure, you turned to Chipotle. A lot. Your days were inspired by some legal role models, and when we asked, some were fictional, like Elle Woods, some are actual and well-deserved icons, like our own Professor Dina Merida and Tony Massaro. You like hard work, so many of you found the great challenges of law school to be surmountable through work, and that makes you justifiably proud to look back, to see your successes, and to realize they were fueled by your own powers. One of your JD classmates captured that common sentiment, saying, Law school helped me understand the old saying about putting your nose to the grindstone, but also why that's good. Mom and Dad, you were right about that one after all. Don't be smug. <laughs> because you did the hard work, you found a sense of empowerment, the heady hard one confidence produced by mastering legal skills and concepts. Just two examples. The first, from a JD student. I won my first trial in my 2L summer, and in that moment realized that I would rather be in a courtroom than almost anywhere else in the world. But I also felt like I belonged there, and that was an amazing feeling. Here's a second account from an MLS student describing her moment of self-empowerment. It wasn't always clear how I would use my legal education, though I enjoyed it and worked really hard. My boss came to me with a problem and I helped her analyze it. And when she walked away, kind of impressed, I wondered for a second, did I actually just do that? That was me? And then I thought, yes, that was me. The little version of her and the little version of Professor Williams who lives inside my head. <laughs> you are doers and have sustained our community, organizing everything from galas to debates, diversity activities to yoga classes, highly cooperative study groups to keenly competitive trivia nights. With these efforts, you have demonstrated your class's connectivity. You value lifelong friendships, you cherish your relationships with others, that you protect the community you have built across all the conventional barriers and lines that keep us apart. I thought a lot about the things that keep us apart. It seems to be in the air these days. And I've searched for the right way to describe our increasingly noisy, and fractious environment and your role in it. We're in a place where truth doesn't merely intersect with falsity. They sometimes seem simply to merge. You come of professional age in a confounding era, and it is a particularly interesting time for those trained in the law. You have learned about outcomes produced by particular sets of facts, that the market value of fact is eroding before our eyes. You have trained your minds to analyze, to reason, yet in our current discourse both seem woefully optional. In your clinical experiences and in your experiential learning, you have come to understand the difference between incivility and spirited discussion. Again, something you find in short supply. Your legal education qualifies you in a very rare and exceptional way to step up to the challenges of our time. To insist on the search for truth, to demand the ends of justice, and to create sustained social and political values that reflect analysis, reason, and reflection. Hard as it may be to fully comprehend, you are now the standard bearers for the rule of law. Please do not confuse the rule of law with the mere defense of the status quo, or of power and inequality embodied in existing law, rules, procedures, institutions, and social norms. Your skills and your accomplishments make you more powerful players in solving the world's most pressing problems. 
It is our greatest and most honorable tradition to create and sustain institutions and processes that reflect our society's commitment to peaceful and orderly progress, not merely by accepting the status quo, but by challenging it and by improving it. In the words of our new U of A president, Bobby Robbins, across programs, our world and our community needs us to be and to train disruptive problem solvers. So class of 2018, SJDs, LLNs, NLSs, JDs, prepare to launch. It's time for you to advance your professions, to assume the mantle of civic leadership, and to be a moral force in whatever you do, remembering we need leaders, we need reason, and most fundamentally, we need you. Just as change is organic to our student population, it is also inevitable for the larger community as well. Today I would like to say goodbye to three of our colleagues here on the stage who leave for positions in other parts of the country. Though each has accomplishments that would constitute a ceremony in their own, I can give you just a few. Mike Shirazi, our Associate Dean for Information Services, and the Beverly and James E. Rogers Professor of Law, joined the college in 1998. This summer, he joins the University of Miami to lead their library and information services effort. From the outset, he has served us in myriad ways as librarian, teacher, scholar, mentor, supervisor, and administrator. And here are just a few examples. Mike has given extraordinary opportunities to the next generation of law librarians by developing a library fellows program that is a model for law schools across the country. He led the College of Law team during our 117,000 square foot renovation, where for an entire year, the law school relocated to other U of A buildings. He inspires great fealty and affection from his staff and from students, especially for the rule change allowing them to meet in the library. And as much joy as he derives from his work, Mike is happiest when he's close to the mosh pit at a rock concert with his wife, Vicky. Indeed, we had planned to recognize that fact by giving him a tie-dyed robe, but it turns out that the robe material wasn't tie-dyed. <laughs> please join me in thanking a rock star who can manage to the budget. Mike Tarazzi, please do. Professors Nina Raven and Dave Marcus and their children head to Los Angeles this summer. Far enough away that we will miss them, but close enough for frequent guest lectures, workshops, and special events. My argument that they risked having their children grow up and be like others who grew up in LA didn't succeed. <laughs> Just as with our newest alumni, once you are part of this community, you are here for a lifetime. And for the 12 years that Dave and Nina have been here as extraordinarily valuable colleagues and truly extraordinary teachers, they now have us forever in their lives. Nina has helped you learn to identify and address the problems of poverty, justice, and inequality in both classroom and clinical settings, to advocate zealously even when the odds are overwhelming, and to speak truth to power, using your legal skills as a profoundly important tool. So many of her students attribute their abilities to her mentorship, noting her authenticity and unwavering faith that things can change. We wish her well at UCLA. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know it until recently, but Dave has the reputation of being a candy bowl colleague. And that's a compliment. He's the one who wanders into your office to get a piece of candy and then ends up asking about your kids or taking a few minutes to talk about how something could be improved or what the latest Supreme Court opinion really means. He makes the human connections that create community and the intellectual connections that make it challenging. I think his colleagues will agree that Dave will not always give you the quickest answer, but it will always be among the most thoughtful. And for me personally, Dave will be the treasured faculty member who stepped up and said, why, yes, I'll draft the strategic plan. 
In the past 12 years, he has meaningfully touched the lives of hundreds of students and more than once has been voted Professor of the Year, including this year. Uh, I didn't tell Dave and Nina I was going to mention them today uh, because they would tell me not to and then I just ignore them anyway, so why? <laughs> uh, Dave and Nina, please stand and let us thank you for everything you have done for our community. To make sure that Dave's habit is covered for at least the first few weeks, here are 750 rolls of Smarty. <laughs> Graduates, today you begin a new life with Arizona Law. You morph from students to alumni. Here to welcome you to that community is Christine Thompson, the incoming president of the Law College Association, of which you are now members. After serving in the Alumni and Development Office at the college for a brief while, Christine led public policy efforts at the State Bar of Arizona, the Arizona Board of Regents, and the State Board of Education. Throughout, she has remained involved in community efforts like Kids Voting Arizona and the Arizona Foundation for Legal Services and Education. Last year, she was named the President and CEO of Expect More Arizona, a statewide champion of excellent education for all students every step of the way. Dean Miller, honored guests, graduates, family and friends. Tomorrow will mark 17 years since I walked across this stage, not imagining what the years would hold. Five jobs in and around state government, great husband and life partner that I hadn't yet met, and twin boys. I didn't imagine that I would be the lead lobbyist for the state university system that I had governed as a student regent while at U of A Law. That a law school classmate would be the chair of the House Higher Education Committee at the time, and that all this would happen during the biggest economic downturn the world's seen since the Great Depression. I couldn't have imagined that I could personally be at the center of a state constitutional crisis that pitted the two constitutional entities responsible for K-12 education. And while that might sound fun to dream about in Professor Massaro's con law class, it isn't as fun in real life as it sounds. I didn't imagine that the 20-year sales tax that Arizona voters had just approved in 2000 well, a little bit over 17 years later, I would be a part of, of securing the renewal of that $660 million dedicated to Arizona education for another 20 years. But I can tell you, I felt prepared. Prepared for my next step, and empowered to take it. On Expect More Arizona's website, we have a statement that says, when our kids graduate prepared, they achieve greatness. That applies to all students, regardless of age. Sitting among you is someone who will make a lot of money, someone who will be an appellate judge, someone who will run and win or lose a campaign for public office, someone who will be the president of a bar association or community nonprofit, or the CEO of big business enterprise, or, or a stay-at-home parent or caregiver, or the head of the PTA. And though you'll all go your separate ways, you'll always be bonded by your experience here. Buoyed by the personal and professional friendships that you started here, prepared by faculty that both teach and admire you, empowered by the skills you have acquired, and confident that you can use those skills to strengthen your community. Today you join more than 7,000 U of A law alumni who constitute a growing global presence, who lead because they're prepared to, who serve because they're called to, and who strengthen their communities in every day in countless ways. On behalf of the Law College Association, of which you are now a member, I welcome you and invite you to stay connected with us. Volunteer to share your story with people considering Arizona law to mentor a law student, to do on-campus interviews from the other side of the table, or to raise money for a scholarship. 
help support our college to nurture, prepare, and empower professionals who, like you, will continue to change the world. Thank you. Graduates who join an alumni base with extraordinary people who have done extraordinary things. Many stay connected and reach back. They have helped you, and I know you will help those who follow you. Giving back is a profoundly important Arizona law tradition. It's been reflected already in the amazing service and gifts you've given to the community for your work while you're here. Your participation in the class of 2018 class gifts reflects your understanding of its importance. I'm here to announce the class gift of two students well known to you. So I spent a little time looking for the right dynamic duo references, uh, and they all failed. Lucy and Ethel? No. Batman and Robin? No, 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 no. Thelma and Louise? Better not. So I'm going to stop while I'm behind and just introduce them. Through their synergy, produce great results for this year's Student Bar Association. They are individually accomplished graduates and look forward to long and productive careers. Please help me welcome Rachel Degman, who this year served as president of the SBA and will be an associate at Snell and Wilmer, and Sarah Wright, our SBA vice president, who leads us to clerk for Judge Sean Greer of that Division II of the uh, Arizona Court of Appeals. class gift, graduate to service. This year, our classmates wanted to continue Arizona Law's proud tradition of serving our community. So, instead of a traditional monetary pledge, our classmates decided to pledge their time, skills, and talents to give back to our community. Community service has been a huge part of both mine and Rachel's lives, and we really wanted to inspire our classmates to do something new that might be a little out of their comfort. So, we asked them to choose one or more areas to pledge their hours. Those areas were animals, arts and culture, community and politics, crisis support, disaster relief, education and literacy, environment, faith-based, health and wellness, veterans and military, and youth and families. The graduates before you today have committed to completing almost 4,500 hours of community service and pro bono work over the course of the next three years. And, not that law students are competitive at all, but we are proud to announce that the class of 2018 pledged almost 1,500 hours more than last year's class gift. <laughs> of this year's graduates participating in the class gift. Students have the opportunity to select specific organizations to pledge their hours, like some of the ones you see on the screen. And guys, Rachel and I were absolutely blown away by your generosity. And we understand that everyone is busy, and we're so proud of your willingness to take the time out to give back to your community. I know that for me, the girls I've had the opportunity to work with have become a part of my family, and my hope is that you all will find something that is just as well. These numbers show both our commitment and devotion to Arizona law, our community who we will practice and live, and our classmates' unity of ideals. It is not only a privilege to graduate today, but it is truly a privilege to continue the Arizona law tradition of giving back to our community. So today, as we finish our time here, we don't just graduate, we graduate to serve. Please join us in congratulating Arizona Law's commitment to service. In selecting our next three speakers, the class of 2018 has given us a preview 
of their collective potential. Benjamin Parsala, no one to all of us as Benji, is most heralded on this campus for his natural cool. You see him representing the college on our marketing materials and larger-than-life posters. Reflected in those pictures is a wonderful combination of curiosity and intellect. A lawyer from Tanzania, Benji has taught human rights, environmental, public, and human rights law. Those same interests drew him here, where he says he gained a sense of assurance that he would succeed in human rights advocacy. Just days ago, he defended his dissertation on the legal and policy barriers to the protection of indigenous people's land rights in his country. Please welcome Benji Parsifal. members of the faculty, fellow graduates, church family members, and friends. We are gathered here today to celebrate our academic accomplishments and reflect on our triumphs and achievements. As Dr. Sean John Holmes once said, throughout my life I have rushed through some of my greatest moments, and if I were to make it to this point, I would take my time and live in this moment. Adhering to his words of wisdom, I would like to take my time, even though I have approximately four minutes, <laughs> and enjoy this moment and dedicate this moment and all the glory to God Almighty for His protection and blessings. On that note, I would like to share a biblical verse that has been very instrumental to me personally and uh, towards this, the accomplishment of this degree. Proverbs 30, verse 7 to 9 reads, Two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. I am profoundly overwhelmed with joy and excitement, but at the same time, I ask myself, why me, Lord? I come from Tanzania. It's a phenomenal country in Africa, home to Mount Kilimanjaro, the beautiful islands of Zanzibar, and other world attractions. Similar to other countries, however, we do have profound obstacles, challenges, and barriers that we face. Acknowledging these obstacles and barriers that we have faced that I personally face for enough. I feel very fortunate and blessed to be standing here amongst these fellow graduates and to give this commencement speech. My friends, it has been an honor to study and learn beside you. Simply put, we are blessed. We are blessed for this university, blessed for the, its dedicated faculty and staff, blessed for our loved ones and for their constant guidance and support which has enabled us to flourish and excel to this point and far beyond. Since my first year of law school back in 2008 in Africa, Tanzania, I knew for a fact that besides practicing law, I wanted to engage in, or I wanted to contribute to the development of law through legal academia and advocacy work to help make this world a better place for this generation and the generations to come. In addition to me being bad at mathematics, those were some of the motivations that propelled me <laughs> to embark on this academic endeavor to pursue a doctorate in law. <laughs> this journey has been difficult, but God has always been there. Though I may have a question this morning at certain points in life, I persevered and I prevailed. I knew for a fact, if you would lead me to it, you would get me through it. Through those lessons, I've learned to appreciate every opportunity that I've been afforded. And one of the most important, important lessons that I've learned through this experience is to stay humble, committed, and to cherish core values that my parents instilled in me. As I come to an end, I would like to take one last opportunity to acknowledge my fellow graduates, JDs, LLMs, MLS, and SJDs. 
I am humbled to be in such esteemed company. Thank you for allowing me to share this moment with you. Although I'm not certain what the future holds, I can say for a fact that this is one of the moments I will cherish for the rest of my life. With that said, I would also like to dedicate this moment to my parents, Professor Dr. Joseph Parcela and my mother Severina Parcela, and my two sisters who came all the way from Tanzania, both and daughters, who are here amongst us today. Thank you. And I would also like to thank my extended Arizona law family. In addition to that, I would like to acknowledge uh, my friends Aaron, Dominic, Brian, and Tony. Uh, you've made me feel home in a foreign place. Thank you so much, and God bless you and your parents. Also, I would like to thank Professor Robert Williams, Melissa Tatum, and Professor Hershey for being phenomenal mentors and for believing in me. As we move forward, let us carry with this, with us the teachings that we have learned at the College of Law. Let us be unafraid of what the future holds. Let us be confident, for we have been equipped to be, we have been equipped to change the world around us for the better. Further, let us refrain from refrain, apologies, from rushing through some of our greatest moments, and let us enjoy this particular moment right now, right here. Thank you all for this moment and the memories you've given me. Tucson, it's been amazing. Thank you. And uh, last, I'd like to quote hip hop philosopher 50 Cent. <laughs> he said, when you see perfection in me, you see God. When you see my imperfections, you see me. The same applies to me. Thank you. God bless. Bear down. Our second speaker, selected by members of the JD class, is Mia Hammersley. She says she came to law school to be a better advocate for the causes and communities she cares about. Her legacy at the college is the establishment of the Justice Advocates Coalition, a student-led initiative to generate interest in public interest in public service careers and to fund summer placements for students working in such positions. For her next step, Mia was selected for the nationwide pool to be an Earth Justice Healthy Communities Fellow in Washington, D.C., and will be using both litigation and advocacy skills to protect those who are disproportionately exposed to environmental health threats. Mia. Being first year law students, we were all too terrified to ask her what she was doing for fear of being asked a question in return that we wouldn't be able to answer. <laughs> when she did reach the opposite side of the classroom from where she began, she stopped to face us, stating that this represented the path to justice. Slow, long, full of setbacks, often one step forward and two steps back. As law students and as lawyers, we are validated and empowered by the steps forward for justice. It reminds us that we are entering a profession that gives us real power to change people's lives for the better. However, 
One of the most challenging aspects of my legal education has been learning about and reckoning with the steps backward. Learning about how our legal system has and continues to systematically oppress people of color, people who are impoverished, and people who need access to justice the most. I have read the Dred Scott decision, where the Supreme Court stated that descendants of Afri African American slaves had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. But I have also read Brown v. Board of Education, where the Supreme Court held that separate but equal is inherently unequal. I have read Bowers v. Hardwick, where the Supreme Court held that the Constitution did not grant protections for individuals living in states that criminalize homosexual relationships. But I've also read Obergefell v. Hodges, the case that established marriage equality for people of all genders. I have read countless cases where tribes have tried to enforce treaties made in good faith with the United States government, only to be denied on the basis of being savage, inferior people. But I also watched the legal community and the world rally against the Dakota Access Pipeline at Standing Rock. Despite my many frustrations with our legal system and the systems of oppression that it often perpetuates, I emerged from these three years with an unshakable sense of hope, largely thanks to the relationships that I have formed here at Arizona Law, to my professors who have become my mentors, to my classmates who have become my friends. You continue to give me hope and inspiration as we all prepare to start this new phase of our lives. To my female identifying class, we will be the ones who will tip the scale of gender inequality in this profession. We will be the ones who will demand to be paid an equal amount to our male colleagues because we know that our work is worth just as much, if not more. We will be the ones to reject the narratives that tell us that we are being too masculine when we are aggressive and uncompromising, and the narratives that tell us that we are too feminine when we are empathetic and kind. To my fellow classmates of color, we will be the ones to rise in this profession, not because we learn to embody and imitate an archetype of success, but because we embrace the strength and resilience that comes from our own histories, cultures, and stories of survival. We, sitting here today, are beyond the wildest dreams of those who came before us. To my male identifying classmates, particularly my white male identifying classmates, you will be the ones who will be allies to the people with less power than you. You will use your voices to advocate on their behalf, but also recognize the times when you need to step back and to listen. You will demand that the other men in your professional and personal lives do the same. We, all of us graduating today, are the future of justice in our communities, in our state, and in our nation. Thanks to my time in Arizona Law, to me, that future shines very brightly. I wish all of you success in your lifelong pursuits of justice. I have confidence that our collective steps forward will far outnumber our steps back. Thank you. Your next speaker, Kayla Bernays, told us a story. It's short, let me read it. There was a distinct moment when I began to feel like a lawyer. And it happened the first time I appeared as a 38D student through the child and family law class. One party wanted to make a motion of some kind, and the judge asked for objections, to which I didn't reply until the judge prompted minor's counsel. And it took me a few extra seconds, and I realized, oh, geez, that's me. <laughs> From that start, she made great headway and will be working as an associate of Arizona Child and Family Law, a small law firm here in Tucson. Welcome, Kayla Bernays. You guys, I'm so sorry, I should have gone first. <laughs> to my class, and I'm sorry in advance to friends and family. This is to my class. I found out that I was elected student speaker when I was walking out of the second day of the bar exam, which 
It was, to say the least, a very nice bit of news after the most early two days of my life, which turned out okay. Um, but almost immediately, I felt kind of bad to get elected because I campaigned for it pretty hard. <laughs> and I made a lot of promises, including but not limited to how I was going to fit in at least 10 quotes from NBC's The Office, or how I was going to read our class list alphabetically and roast you all one by one. Um, and I knew that then that I would come through on none of those promises. Oh, okay, so we, ah, I can't say that. You'll do it. <laughs> and coincidentally, that's my first office quote. <clears throat> Still, I was grateful for the opportunity to stand up here and speak to you all, my 120 absolute closest friends. So instead of making jokes that make our poor administration deeply uncomfortable, and instead of waxing poetic and giving advice that I'm supremely unqualified to give, I thought that I'd take the time to say thank you. On my behalf, of course, but also on behalf of all of us, I think, for what we gave each other over the last few years. First, thank you to our classmates who, on the very first day of orientation, were willing to reach out and say hi to perfect strangers. Thank you especially for forgetting how weird we were on day one and keeping talking to us anyway. Thank you to our classmates whose hands seemed almost magnetically attracted to the ceiling and who couldn't stop talking if they wanted to. <laughs> and who made it so much easier for those of us who maybe didn't get to last night's reading assignment to make it through lecture unnoticed. And a special thank you to our classmates who Facebook messaged us quick answers when we couldn't manage to go unnoticed. Thank you to our classmates. <laughs> I thought I'd address it. <laughs> Thank you to our classmates who were always equipped with words of affirmation when studying made us reconsider every choice we'd ever made that led us to law school. Thank you to our classmates who were always down for a quick break when we needed it most. And thank you to our classmates who didn't blame us when that quick break ended up taking three hours. <laughs> Thank you to our classmates who selflessly provided their outlines when finals and emotional breakdowns loomed a bit too close for comfort. And thank you to our classmates who, with only small signs of exasperation, were willing to brief us on important points even minutes before our finals began. Thank you to our classmates who respected the don't talk about the final right after the final rule. <laughs> thank you as well to the classmates who didn't. But mostly, thank you for always separating yourselves into discrete groups in the courtyards that we could choose for ourselves, whether we wanted to participate in the commiseration or whether we wanted to head straight to planning to meet on University Boulevard for a good meal. Thank you to our classmates who celebrated the good news with us, engagements with new children and job offers, and a different thank you to the classmates who comforted us when the news wasn't so good, losing loved ones, getting rejected from jobs, presidential elections. <laughs> Thank you to our classmates who qualify as realists, who kept us on track and focused. Thank you to our classmates who don't, who brought a little extra play into a pretty unplayful degree program. Thank you to our classmates who seemed to decide early on that competition was less important than being decent. And thank you to our classmates for your never-ending support, for your kindness, and for your friendship. As one of these brand new graduates, here's my parting wish for my class, to be grateful for our time here and for the opportunities that lie ahead because of our time here, and most of all, for each other, because I know that I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for you sitting there. And by that I mean my graduating, not my getting to get to be the student speaker, for which I also wouldn't be here if it wasn't for sitting there. It was ended up being pretty cool, so thanks for that. I feel God in this chilies tonight. Thank you for everything and congratulations. <laughs>
her J.D. degree, J.D. degree of course from the University of Arizona in 1994. After graduation, she held numerous senior posts in the Clinton administration and returned to her home state to serve then Governor Janet Napolitano. Chavez was recently named the first ever Executive Vice President and Chief Growth Officer at the National Council of Aging at NACOA. She was promoted to this role after successfully leading NACOA through a strategic learning process to position the 67-year-old organization for greater social impact in the future. Before joining NACOA, Chavez was the first woman of color to serve as CEO of the Girl Scouts of the USA. She has been named one of the world's 50 greatest leaders by Fortune magazine and was number 22 on the Fast Company's 2016 annual list of the most creative people in business. She's the recipient of the 2013 Excellent in Community Service Award from the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, as well as the 2013 Graciela Olivares La Raza Award from the National Council La Raza. speakers on the stage. Can we give them a round of applause? of emotional crisis because I had promised my older brother Renee to take him to meet one of our greatest heroes um, that we've admired for 30 years. So instead of being in New Jersey this evening, spending an evening with Rob Lowe, I'm here with you. <laughs> but I do have to say that um, I'm thrilled, couldn't be more thrilled to be here um, because I love the U of A and I love the education that I got at the law school. I remember sitting right there in these seats in 1994, yes, that's 24 years ago. It has gone by so quickly. And back then, on the stage, taking this spot was Attorney General Grant Woods. And he was very inspirational and he told us we had everything we needed to take on the world. And then I got up as a student speaker and tried to be prolific in my words, but all I remember was I was really nervous and I talked really, really fast. But I do remember who was here with me at that time and who continue to be my biggest supporters. Like the actor, one of the many actors, Mark Wilbur, I travel with a posse, and my posse is here today. My mother and father, Jose and Maria Chavez, who are in the audience, and my Aunt Martha, and my dad. So to all the families that are sitting here, now you feel much better because I dragged them back to look at the same ceremony 24 years later. And they're here. I will also tell you that they put me to bed really early last night and said, you know, Ana, you have to be on stage tomorrow speaking, so you need to be in bed by 9. They come out at the hotel bar dancing to great music. I'm just saying. <laughs> so, you know, I remember very distinctly being in law school because I, I'm going to bring you in on a little secret. I actually wanted to be a lawyer since I was 12. Um, I love law school. Actually, my friends were teasing me. They're like, you have crushes on all of your professors. Because I would sit right in the front row and smile the entire time. I remember sitting in Professor Gans's international trade law class as he was preaching about NAFTA and the GATT, and I was just giddy. And people were like, you are off. But I told him, but, but you've got to understand, I've been waiting for this moment my entire life, since I was 12 years old. Law school is a joyous moment for me. And I knew, I knew for a fact that every single minute I was getting knowledge that would not only really change my life, but the lives of people around me. And I learned that lesson. I 
actually sitting in a little house just down Interstate 10. Town's called Eloy, Arizona. No, you all know it because you stop at the truck stop. You pass on the way to Phoenix when you're going shopping or to a cool concert. That's where I grew up. It's a great community. But what I didn't know was that I was learning valuable lessons about haves and have-nots and how society can separate people based on race, class, wealth, and expectations, as well as how the law can disproportionately impact certain populations. I knew from a very young age I wanted to be an advocate. Actually, I remember distinctly. I was 12 years old. I was a Girl Scout. Yes, and I have to uh, make acknowledgement to some former bosses in the room. It's true, Bradley true, number 157. You're right there. Hello. Thank you. Great bosses. Thank you. Walk on. Like them, I was learning about the world, and I had my little science kit, and my parents had taken me to catch a peak for a picnic, but I had my science kits, and I was working with the soil, because I think I was working with my science hat. And I noticed that these kids had graffiti all over the store cage, cave at the state park. And I knew it had to be boys, and it couldn't have been girls. And so I got really, really mad. So I grabbed my science kit, I put it under my arm, and I marched down the hill to my parents and spread out this picnic for us. And I walked up to my mother and my father, and I said, I'm upset. I'm horrified. And they looked at me and they're like, what's wrong? I explained to them the horrific scene I just witnessed, the sample of soil that I now have. And they're like, what is the problem? I said, somebody has to stop this. They're destroying a historic monument. And my mother looks at me and says, well, what are you going to do about it, Anna Maria? I said, well, well, because somebody has to pass the law. And my mother said, yes, Anna Maria? Well, I guess I'm going to be a lawyer. <laughs> Twelve years old. So that's all it took for this advocacy and this fire in me to be lit. But I didn't know at the same time that traditionally girls in my category, young, Hispanic, poor, and in a rural county in Arizona in the 1970s, didn't break significant economic or educational barriers. Most of my friends, my age, unfortunately, when they reached teenage years, were risking teen pregnancy and low achievement rates in school. But I was lucky. I had people around me who broadened my horizons and my journey towards self-discovery and engagement with the world was made possible with these amazing parents and amazing teachers who sit behind me. Who I remember very fondly. Hi, Professor Ratner. <laughs> I passed his class, I was so excited. <laughs> and volunteers that sat in communities and were determined that not on their watch was this kid going fall into these traps. We were going to put her on a divergent path. So through deliberate and stubborn commitment, they gave me real life examples to follow. And I am forever grateful. Just like all of you sitting in the audience today, all these people behind you, they matter. Respect them. Appreciate them. Don't get the calls that I get from my mother. You never call. <laughs> but what about the girls and boys who don't get the same investment that we've received? And why as leaders, both men and women, and most importantly, as law school graduates, should we care and speak up for them? Well, full disclaimer as a lawyer, I'm going to try to convince you today that it is not only necessary for you to invest time that you've obviously gained here with this amazing education, but it's prepared you for this critical role as a catalyst. In fact, it has prepared you to be a moral leader in this country at this time. Over the last 20 years, I've had the privilege to travel across this great country and the globe, and I've seen moral leadership displayed through incredible acts of heroism, strength, and tenacity. I've sat in a rural Texas country store and chatted with the woman owner who sells scarves and jewelry on the side, but really uses her store as the political hub for women who want to serve 
in some sort of elected capacity in rural Texas, or simply others who want to come in and get advice on how to open their own business. I've witnessed young boys overcome abuse and neglect from people they love the most, only to go on to create positive solutions for other children in their community. I've seen a mom and dad of immigrant roots see their daughter cross a university stage to receive the first college diploma in their entire family's history. And I've taken a delegation of girl leaders to meet the Pope at the Vatican because we wanted to ensure that faith leaders understood the need to invest in girls. So these are the voices and images I carry with me today and inspire me to continue to advocate for women, children, and individuals who are underrepresented or silenced due to their ethnicity, gender, or economic struggle. These are the voices that require all of us, all of us, to be moral leaders to ensure that they do not go unheard. And yes, I was honored to serve as the CEO of the Girl Scouts of the USA. We fought hard to empower girls. But I gotta be honest, as the first one of color to serve in that role, not only did I take on the establishment around issues surrounding girls, I took on the clan. I took on white supremacy. And so for those of you sitting in the audience thinking that things have changed since the 1940s and 50s, awaken, my friends. You are not going into these communities to represent people who need the most critical representation in times of great need. So I left the Girl Scouts then to go on to advocate on behalf of seniors. And I'm part of a small but mighty team. We fight every day so all Americans have the right to age well. Because back in 2003, while serving Governor Napolitano's administration here in Arizona, I helped launch the Governor's Aging 2020 Initiative. I used to wear this button, I was a little younger then, and used to say, aging, if it's not your issue, it will be. <laughs> because the fact is, I feel like a Marine on the wall right now in Washington, D.C. Because we're already hearing that Congress is thinking of rolling back Social Security and Medicare. So my colleagues and I at the National Council on Aging are working hard to ensure that the have and have nots get what they need. And half of people age 65 and over are our biggest constituents because half of people over age 65 and over are poor or near poor. And another 40% are one event away from economic insecurity. And women bear even worse. I'll tell you why. The pay gap. They earn less, save less. So when they get to be 65 and are thinking of retirement, they haven't put away a big egg nest. But again, we need your help to ensure that every American has the right to age with their best possible health and economic security, regardless of their background and current situation. And as lawyers, we have an obligation to make sure everyone is able to exercise their rights. We also have an obligation to give back to others who are trying to make their way in our profession. You will quickly realize that people will mark your every word and will come to you in their darkest hours of need. This is a huge responsibility and part of your moral leadership mantle. I remember this lesson very well over the last 24 years. And I remember one in particular. When my son was just one years old, I was up really late at night taking care of him and I came across an email asking for volunteers for the Arizona Supreme Court's Committee on Examination. Hey, I thought I'd put my name in, never thinking they'd pick me, and they did. But I didn't read the fine print that it said, it's a seven year commitment. Chosen, and by the sixth year of writing, grading, and administering the Arizona Bar Exam, I was asked to chair the committee and lead the proctory for the July examination, actually right here in Arizona. I knew it was a huge responsibility, and I used to stand.
stand up in front of the podium and look out at the 700 plus examinees as they hunkered down at their desk for a two day bar exam. And I would call out instructions at the beginning of the day and then I would walk around the convention center just proctoring the exam. So months later, after this particular exam, my mother, Maria Chavez, who you've met this evening, was here in Tucson yet again at a luncheon. And she was sitting down at a luncheon table with this young Latina who was brooding over in pride that she had just gotten news that she had passed the bar exam. They were going on and on and on, and my mother said, well, how was it? And she said, well, you know, I was really nervous. I thought I did well in law school, but I got to the bar exam, and I just lost my mind, and literally, the afternoon of the first day, I said, this is it. I can't do this. I'm not smart enough. I, 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 I'm going to fail. So she started packing up her stuff to leave the convention center and looked up while this person was standing next to the table. And she looked up and saw this Latina in it, and she had a name tag, and it said, Examiner Chavez. So this young lord looks up, sees this woman, and says, you know what? She can do it. I can do this. And she sits back down, finishes the bar exam, and a few months later is having lunch with my mother. My mother, of course, took all credit for my bio and history and the influence that she has in this community. But the reason I sort of bring that up is to say that this story taught me a great deal about our ability to impact people around us. Even if we think we aren't making progress or we aren't qualified to give advice, that our own actions speak volumes to those who are watching. And even with our own crosses to bear, we must take on those duties to lift the load for others. So graduates, as you embark on this wonderful trail, whether it was a, a PhD in the law or a JD, you have an amazing opportunity to take this legal education forward. So I have four wishes for you. The first wish I have is that you focus on issues and projects you are most passionate about. As I turned 50 last month, yes, 50, I realized I wasted too much time worrying about things that never happened or that I couldn't change. I realized that I'm the happiest and most productive when I'm dedicating my time, energy, and heart to issues and causes I care about and that help the most vulnerable amongst us. Second, I wish that you surround yourself with people who respect your knowledge and support your life vision. Life is too short to worry about people who think they know why you should be doing what you're doing or that you should be doing something different. It should only matter that you are doing your best with your investment in time. Feedback's a gift. Take what resonates and move on. Third, I wish that you leverage that heck out of your rare ability to live at the intersection of law, society, ethics, and public policy. Whether you run for office or decide to start your own company, you have a great platform to model the best of moral leadership, especially when things get tough and you find yourself on the lonely side of the issue. FYI, you can join me in Washington. And lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't share a special wish for the ladies in the room today. I have learned that there are different expectations for female leaders in this country. When women raise their voices, when women raise their hands in the classroom and say, I have an opinion, Sometimes the reaction is, boy, that woman is bossy. No, 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 I say to that. We're betting that word. Just ask Cheryl Sandberg, she helped me do that. You are displaying your executive leadership style, ladies. We need everyone to lead, because when we have gender balanced leadership in this country, things are really gonna start to happen. So, in closing, graduates, Congratulations. I am so happy for you. And my final wish is that you recognize that this is not the end. This is the beginning. You will be coming back in 24, 25 years, reliving this moment, thinking to yourself, I left everything on that stage. I mean, I went out there, I went for that breast ring, and I had the people who felt they didn't have a voice. And that because of me, because of me, a young girl 
And this audience will go on, not only to be a class speaker at a law school, but will go on to be the first female president of the United States of America. Thank you. Don't worry, it was only the pages where we were the degrees. And I'm very thankful that was fabulous and to all the speakers. What a great stage, intellectually and emotionally, to now set us on the path to recognizing each of our graduates. We begin by awarding the SJD and LLM degrees. Earning an advanced law degree is an ambitious and exacting endeavor, requiring study and scholarship beyond the JD degree. Professor Robert Williams will call the names of SJD and LLM students. Dr. Willie Jordan Curtis and Assistant Dean and Registrar Mike Brooks will present diplomas. Receiving the SJD, Mary. Receiving the SJD role, we are all day in Dallas. Receiving the SJD. Benji Parson. <laughs> Receiving the SJD, Chroma Lucapaja. Receiving the yellow lamp, Nicholas Hurtado. <laughs> Receiving the yellow lamp, Ira Olguin. Receiving the LLM, Fawaz Awadab. <laughs> MLS Program Director Keith Swisher will read names of graduate and students in our Master of Legal Studies program. And then finally, we will award degrees to the JT class. We'll call Professor Adams. Vance L. Fabon. Viviana Galindo. <laughs> Stephanie Skull. <laughs> Jessica Lane. Vic 
Victor Chabira. Christina Waters. Robin Burke Alada. Victor Uzuchuko. Quindero Elizabeth Cheatham Frieder. Hylia <laughs> O'Quinn. Sophia Nuno Nano. <laughs> Arnolfo Elias. Time to award the JD to the members of the class of 2018. Professor Jamie Rapper will read those names. Norbert Isaacs. Iro Oki. Sarah Nicole Snelling. Sindhu Ventana Romney. Sonia Sharma. Jinlan Lu. Mari 
Tori Young.
Joshua Messick. Julie Pat. <laughs> Denny Jontea. <laughs> Renier Ballesteros. Francisco Alejo. Aram Koyajan. 
John A. Irwin. Douglas Imperi. Russell Johnson. Richard McManus. Joshua White. William Perry. Alexander Fowler. <laughs> Melissa Ellen Begall. Rachel Dyke. <laughs> Shannon Marie Scola. Claudia Ginescu. David Barlow. Maximilian Ryder Redder. Shilpita Sam. Ishmael Boutin. <laughs> G. And you're right. George Ayenga. <laughs> Maxine Kibinets Yet. Joshua Messer. <laughs> P. 
Sabori. Kimberly Soto. Sarah Wright. Kayla Bernays. Benjamin Pierce. John Paul Barnum. <laughs> Camilo Rodriguez. Joseph Bonacera. 
Jesse, Antonio, Goliath. Francisco Ortiz.
Globalization is not the only revolution changing our understanding of community work and life. Technology writ large is a force that is sometimes shocking, but it's always in subtle and pervasive ways changing our lives as well, including the practice of law. There's a big conversation around the U of A under the label of the fourth industrial revolution. What it means to be human to work, to compete, to produce music and art, to express our preference about everything from paper towels to our elected representatives is being changed, questioned and rethought. I hope we have trained you to be leaders in reshaping society in response to these extraordinary forces and extraordinary times. So, but for one thing, we are done. And that one thing is the magical words that makes this moment official. By the authority transferred to me for this ceremony by Dr. Robert C. Robbins, invested in him by the Arizona Board of Regents, I confer on you the applicable degrees of Juris Doctor, Master of Laws, Master in Legal Studies, or SJD. To all of you who have joined us today, thank you. I ask that you stay seated to allow our graduates to recess from the hall, and then we will share in the celebration. And let me conclude with the words of two of my favorite philosophers, and in the spirit of the comments from your classmates earlier today, for me, it is John Lennon and Paul McCartney. And every year I close with these words, and every year I speak them, but several of your classmates challenged, dared, asked, made me to sing them. <laughs> and in the end, the love you take is equal 